SCP-7000 The Loser Every time the SCP wiki moves on to a new series, meaning the next set of 1,000 entries, there's a contest to determine the first slot for that new series. Each contest of this type has an overall theme, for which writers are encouraged to work around and work into their articles. The theme for the SCP-7000 contest was luck, which is fairly broad in nature. The winner, SCP-7000, deals with luck and probability in general, especially in what happens if that concept goes haywire, but also more specifically it deals with a person being unlucky. A person's luckiness or unluckiness is a fairly fluid concept in general, and we often attribute all sorts of different events to a person being lucky or unlucky, if such a thing could exist. What happens if a person is never lucky though? What happens if that person is only unlucky for their entire life? What follows is an article filled with all sorts of oddities and slapstick humor, but also a surprising amount of heart. We begin with a Priority One announcement sent out by Dr. Dan, Director of the Emergent Threat Tactical Response Authority, or ETRA, of the Foundation. A global LK-class twist of fate probability failure scenario is presently in progress, so for the duration of the crisis, any and all requests coming from ETRA personnel are mandatory directives carrying O5 authority. Any Foundation personnel with undeclared anomalous conditions declaring themselves to an ETRA representative at this time will be granted amnesty from containment, amnestization, or termination. It's vital to the Foundation's continued survival that all internal probability vectors be identified and countered, and it's vital to the continuance of the human race that this organization survives. Dr. Dan ends the announcement by stating that they hold dominion over paranormalcy, and their law supersedes Murphy's. Let's get into what exactly an LK-class twist of fate probability failure scenario is. SCP-7000 is a progressive randomization of probability factors and anomalous fortuity on the planet Earth, and potentially beyond. The effect is not total, as a complete failure of probabilities would quickly terminate consensus normalcy, but is rather piecemeal. Each factor is randomized to a different extent, for a different length of time, and often with a different geographical radius of effect, corresponding to no obvious logical pattern. You'll see what exactly this means soon enough. Nevertheless, the cumulative impact of many nonsensical and high-profile outcomes to formerly predictable actions is degrading the veil of secrecy at an alarming rate, and jeopardizing containment efforts worldwide. The cause of this disruption is, at present, unknown. SCP-7000-1 is Dr. William Wallace Weddell, a white male, 54 years of age, presently serving as Deputy Chair of Replication Studies at Site-43. His relationship to SCP-7000 is classified as Level 4 Secret. So in other words, with normally predictable things no longer being completely predictable, things are going haywire, as you can imagine. It wouldn't take long for the public at large to learn something is wrong with the universe, and on top of that, unpredictability makes the Foundation's job of containing dangerous anomalies even harder. This started on July 7th, as a Foundation web crawler reported unusual behavior from Random.org, an online number generation service that the Foundation uses to check for any changes in universal probability. Computers can only generate pseudo-random values due to the inherent predictability of programming code, but random.org circumvents this by converting natural atmospheric radio noise, achieving true randomness. 
The Foundation web crawler checks this every day by issuing daily requests for 10 random numbers between 1 and 10, 1 and 100, and 1 and 1000, as an early warning signal for probability collapse. The results for July 6, 2022 had been suitably random across the board, while the results for the following day consisted of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 20, 30, 40, 50, 1, 200, 300, 400, 500, and so on. Meteorological investigation revealed that all atmospheric noise, regardless of weather conditions, now produces non-random numbers in discernible sequence. The web crawler immediately activated a brute force redirect from random.org's number generator to itself, and began generating pseudo-random numbers for public consumption, until the anomaly could be identified and contained. Etra and the analytics department were then informed, and analytics quickly generated a list of statistically unlikely events that also occurred on July 7th, testifying to a rapid and widespread ontokinetic event. For one, a Chaos Insurgency infiltrator was captured whilst engaged in a series of cryptic acts at Area 150. They possessed a partial step compilation, an operational overview prepared by the insurgency's leader, the engineer, from data provided by an enigmatic stochastic prediction device, the engine. In simpler terms, it's an anomalous machine that's designed to predict randomness. One of the steps on the overview suggested traveling between two structures via a tarmac path, but the infiltrator was interrupted by the sudden onset of a violent storm and was knocked unconscious by a large hailstone. The subject was detained and interrogated, but since the engine's master plan and ultimate goal are never made clear to any individual insurgent, it remains possible that this was the desired outcome. Secondly, the sudden and wholesale collapse of all extant cryptocurrency markets occurred, but no action was taken on the Foundation's part, as this event was fully consistent with long-term probability models. Third, SCP-179, the humanoid entity near our star that warns the Foundation of any incoming threats, expressed obvious confusion, identifying threats in eight directions corresponding to the cardinal compass points. Due to the prohibitive expense of replacing solar probes after a mishap, no attempts were made to communicate directly with SCP-179 until stable probability is restored. Fourth, the old, faithful Cone Geyser in Yellowstone National Park began erupting every 13 minutes, rather than its usual pattern of around 65 or 91 minutes, which it has followed since at least 1870. The area was evacuated and a scientific cordon was implemented to disguise parascientific investigation. Fifth, the Foundation's anomalous insurer, Goldbaker Rhines Insurance Group LTD, made hundreds of millions of dollars in uncorrelated low-yield investments. Goldbaker Rhines representatives responded to all inquiries from the Foundation by saying that they would be pleased to discuss these unforeseen developments in person, should they wish to trigger an early review of their policies at this time, although they stated that these developments were not unforeseen by them. No actions were taken, and the investments subsequently crashed the following day. GR representatives were unresponsive to further inquiries. Etra declared a state of emergency on July 8th, with the O5 Council granting Etra amnesty powers over any staff with undeclared anomalous conditions in order to encourage self-identification. Unaccounted for ontokinetic or thaumaturgical factors could theoretically complicate scenario mitigation efforts. This resulted in multiple staff members at Site 43 coming forward for anomalous classification, the last of which was Dr. Weddell, interviewed on July 13th by Dr. Sokolsky, Deputy Director of ETRA. The two clearly know each other, with Weddell asking why they've got him doing interviews now, to which Sokolsky says that it's an all-hands-on-deck crisis. Weddell remarks that it feels like those are getting closer together now. 
Sikolsky says that they're extremely busy, but with the world having found a fun and creative new way to end, so he doesn't want Weddle to waste his time. He knows that Weddle is a time waster, and a hypochondriac to boot, so he wants to know what anomalous condition Weddle thinks he has, so he can dismiss it out of hand. Weddle responds that he's unlucky, causing Sokolsky to swear. Weddle says that he's extremely unlucky, as good things don't happen to him, period. Game-changingly bad things don't happen to him either, he's just stuck in a cycle where nothing he does turns out right. Sokolsky asks if he realizes that this is a walk-in clinic for closeted reality benders, and he's a disaster response coordinator, not a therapist. Weddle says that he's in charge of replication studies, and he's done some replication studies on himself. He pulls out of his pocket three large pieces of pocket lint, a plastic bottle cap, a lab coat button, a Canadian quarter, and a push pin, the point of which is piercing his thumb. He then says that he'll call the quarter in the air and flips it, calling heads. The coin proceeds to stick to a piece of gum on the ceiling. Weddle then says that that doesn't matter, and asks Sokolsky to think of a number between 1 and 10. After going through all nine numbers, including mentioning three twice, he finally lands on the correct number. Afterwards, the coin falls from the ceiling, landing on Dr. Weddle's head, now with the gum attached to it. He says that he has coin flip records going back 20 years, and he's never once called it correctly. He then gestures at the gum in his hair and says that this is his whole life, and has been since he doesn't know when. Every decision he makes is a mistake and everything that can go wrong, does go wrong. He's been exposed to so many anomalies that they stopped bothering with the one-week E-class quarantine. He has no agency and no control, and everyone else moves forward while he stands still, because his foot is stuck between the train track boards. He calls himself a negative probability sink. Sokolsky asks if it affects other people to which Weddell thinks that it can. He makes his staff run through a few periodic exercises to reset their luck, which seems to protect them from the backwash. He was going to write a paper about it, and thought he'd have to write it from a containment cell. Sokolsky asks why he's sharing this now, as he could have kept it secret indefinitely since most people around here just think he's a clumsy idiot. Weddell says that, if this kind of stuff is getting worse, with random stuff not being random anymore and predictable stuff going haywire, he's liable to get hit by a bus the moment he walks out the topside elevator. Sikolsky says that buses don't run around here, but Weddle says that with his bad luck and their bad luck combined, they might make an exception. Sikolsky then asks if any of his record keeping has changed in the past week but Weddle says that it's the same for him as usual, with every single call going wrong. Sikolsky says that there are 136 probabilistic anomalies on record, and he just became the 137th. For the first time in his miserable life, he's someone special. Afterwards, Sokolsky developed a tentative theory to explain why Weddle was still consistently unlucky rejecting some of Weddle's conclusions out of hand. He then engaged in a handful of informal interviews, primarily with the staff of Site 43, to confirm his suspicions. He first speaks with Dr. Harold Blank, an acquaintance of Weddle's, starting by asking him if he's friends with Weddle. Blank says that, sure, they're friends, which consists of Weddle following him around, him making fun of Weddle, and Weddle eventually falling over or walking into something. He then helps him get up or calls the medics. They have a kind of give and take thing going on, where Weddle gives him headaches and he takes the piss out of him. Sokolsky remarks that the two look similar, and he bets that Weddle thinks about that a lot, like he could almost be like Blank, with a better job, more friends, and a wife. 
Blank says he feels bad for him sometimes, but he lives down to his station, calling him an ass. Sikolsky then asks if he ever thinks there's anything anomalous about his blundering about. Blank admits that one or two times maybe he has, mentioning a flood at his wedding last month that Weddle caused, and then tells Sikolsky to speak to Weddle's ex-wife. Sikolsky then goes to speak to his ex-wife, under the cover of working for Silly Crab Productions and doing a background check on Weddle to see if there's any skeletons in his closet. His ex-wife clearly has little love for Weddle, calling him selfish and worthless, doubting that he's improved much since the divorce. She mentions a few incidents, such as him dropping her camera off Niagara Falls on their honeymoon, face planting into her father's cake on his 70th birthday, and him getting fired from his job after showing up to the wrong office for two weeks. Finally, she got into a car accident after being so angry at him that she drove straight into a minivan. The day after she got out of the hospital, Weddle just left, without explaining why. She says that she was better off without him, and still is, and they'd be better off without him as well. Sokolsky then goes to one of Weddle's research assistants, Gabrielle O'Connor, who says that she's never met a more inconsiderate person. She doesn't know how many times she's caught him taking the last drop of coffee and leaving without making more. His excuse was apparently that if he made the coffee, they'd all probably get bean poisoning. She says that that's definitely not a thing, and if you're going to be a jerk, at least own up to it. Sokolsky asks if she would characterize him as unlucky, but she says it would be more like karma. He'd want to ask researcher LeBlanc about that though, as he's made a study of it. Sokolsky goes to LeBlanc, telling him that Gabby thinks he's got the scoop on Weddle, to which LeBlanc asks why he's talking like a 50s newsboy. Sokolsky asks him if Weddle has ever told him about his luck anomaly, and after a period of hesitation, says that Weddle has come clean to Etra for amnesty. LeBlanc says that he kind of didn't believe that it was for real, and Weddle thinks that he's a bad luck magnet. He has rituals to make sure the luck doesn't rub off on anyone else. Sokolsky asks if he thinks that that's plausible, but LeBlanc just says that all he knows is that Weddle is worried about it. Sokolsky then says that LeBlanc's girlfriend, O'Connor, doesn't think he worries about other people at all, and asks if Weddle has any problem with his employees dating. LeBlanc says that it's only been a month, but he's never mentioned it, and why would he, because he can be a jackass, but he's not cruel. He kind of likes Weddle, saying that he's stuck in a bad pattern and trying to break out of it, as he's not all that bad once you get to know him. Sokolsky says that he's known him for 20 years, and maybe LeBlanc just doesn't know him well enough. He spent that entire time talking himself up, trying to get noticed, trying to outdo everyone around him, and it's never worked out, so now he's too old to change. LeBlanc, however, thinks that he has changed, as he hasn't been doing any of that for months. If anything, he's been avoiding attention, trying to stay under the radar. He asks if maybe Sikolsky has been misjudging him for 20 years, but Sikolsky counters by wondering if Weddle has been misjudging himself. LeBlanc's luck has been pretty good since he transferred here and Sokolsky asks about the accident logs at Site-43 for the week. Apparently, there hasn't been a single accident reported at the site all week, to which Sokolsky says that absent trends are the hardest to spot. Afterwards, Sokolsky went to Dr. Dan, director of ETRA, with an experimental proposal involving SCP-7000 and Dr. Weddle. Meanwhile, the probabilistic breakdown of the planet continued to progress, with effects felt most keenly by the paranormal community. Sloth's Pit in Wisconsin ceased to operate according to the rules of narrative logic, which effectively reduced Sloth's Pit to the status of an average Midwestern American town. 
A senior associate at Marshall, Carter & Dark was killed in a folding couch accident, and an earthquake occurred in Antarctica, with the epicenter determined to be based around a buried Chaos Insurgency base, with 53 personnel inside, all who died of asphyxiation. On July 16th, Dr. Dan presented a briefing to the O5 Council concerning the situation. He says that the situation is not sustainable, and something must be done. They have butterflies causing super typhoons in the South China Sea, and the people who decided that that would be a fun experiment are in irons. They have black cats, mirrors, and ladders changing the arcs of people's lives out there. They've had to task two AIs with sniping eBay auctions because suddenly everything is rare, unless it should be. There were 15 auctions for pieces of toast with Jesus' face burned into them when he got up this morning, and only three of them were faked. Procurement and liquidation reports that every agent who goes to a garage sale now comes home with a handful of anomalies. Half the kittens in the world are being born with six or more toes on each foot, and they're going to either have to brainwash the entire scientific establishment into believing some bogus argument about atmospheric factors to explain it away, or put a lot of cats back into the bag, and the bag into one hell of a deep dark river. 057 says that that was quite the preamble, and asks if it was worth wasting precious time he could have spent pressing them to a solution. Dr. Dan says that it was worth the time because not everything he mentioned is strictly probabilistic. Kittens having more toes than normal is a heritable mutation. Rare items for sale have nothing to do with random chance, as probability doesn't make valuable man-made objects start existing where they didn't exist before, and hen's teeth just doesn't happen at all outside of the lab. 057 says that he didn't even mention hen's teeth, to which Dan responds that he hasn't mentioned about 500 other things either. This is definitely a probability crisis, but it just isn't entirely that. Everyone who ate the potentially lethal fugu fish yesterday lived, while everybody who ate it today died. Dice come up snake eyes today, after 24 hours of natural sixes yesterday. So many people are catching shiny Pokemon that they've had to knock out Nintendo's online services, every fan site, and a few Reddit communities to avoid the word getting around. They've had to slot agents into every extant gaming commission to manipulate their numbers, or where possible, just close the casinos entirely on the pretext that it's too dangerous to operate them during COVID. In Vegas, they had to broker a deal with the under-Vegas demons to run fixed games on the Strip, to hide the fact that honest gambling, to the extent that such a thing exists, straight up doesn't work anymore. They're dealing with an extremely complex constellation of strictly probabilistic and superstitious luck effects, which they're calling one anomaly for lack of a better explanation. Every probabilistic anomaly in the database is either dead as a doornail or operating wildly outside of established parameters, as of right now. The exception is Dr. William Weddell, potentially the most important employee they have, as he's the only probabilistic anomaly still operating as usual. Dr. Dan has no idea why as of yet, as they haven't had the time to study him, but they have extensive records of data, showing that as of this moment, Dr. Weddell is the only reliable probability factor on the planet Earth. On the face of it, this doesn't mean a whole lot for them. If he had good luck, they could use that, but bad luck isn't really useful aside from sending him over to some other group of interest. If Weddell is just personally unlucky, then it's nothing better than a baseline for predictable probability but Dr. Dan thinks that there's more to it. Weddell believes that bad luck clings to him like an ontokinetic cloud, with the universe taking any opportunity to get a cheap shot in on him. If he gets an overload, it can bleed into his surroundings and cause chaos. Sikolsky adds on to this, however, observing that right now, 
Site 43 is the luckiest place on Earth, experiencing only good luck effects. Going over some older data, it seems like a general trend, and Site 43 has always been one of the luckiest places on Earth. Dr. Dan thinks that this is because of Dr. Weddle. He believes that everyone else's bad luck wears off onto Weddle, and since unavoidable, unpredictable bad luck is presently their biggest issue in dealing with the effects of SCP-7000, he thinks that they can use Weddle. He wants to use Weddle as a stabilizing agent for their spot treatments, putting together a mobile task force with Weddle on it, and let them swoop in to save the day wherever necessary. He says to call the MTF the Magnificent Seven or something, but the O5s shoot that down, saying that half of the Magnificent Seven die. Dan says that they'll use this team for all high-value deployments where possible, to ensure success, with six expert super soldiers and one walking time bomb to wander around and soak up the bad karma. He calls it Operation Black Swan. He also has a theory about SCP-7000 in general, but he would rather it not go on record as he doesn't want to jinx himself. After telling it to the O5s, they ask in disbelief if he's serious, and then ask about the photo on the slide projector which shows two eggs with double yolks. Dan says that every egg in his house has two yolks now, and this phenomenon is going to affect every aspect of their lives before long. That means that he's as serious as he's ever been about potential solutions. The O5 Council subsequently approves Operation Black Swan. Captain Andrea Adams assembles five of her top performing agents to fill out the ranks of the MTF Theta 7000 Fortunate Sons, and begins a rigorous training period along with Dr. Weddle. Despite possessing advanced survival instruction as a consequence of his existing esoteric containment duties, Weddle scored significantly lower than the previous bottom percentile on all MTF training metrics. The acceleration of SCP-7000 phenomena nevertheless necessitated the denial of his repeated request to be relieved of this new duty, as well as similar requests on his behalf by Captain Adams. Further reports of the phenomenon from around the world show a steady increase in accounts of chickens born with teeth, causing the Foundation to create a thread on the Parawatch forums suggesting that the phrase, rare as hen's teeth, refers not to a scientific impossibility, but instead a hereditary mutation which GMOs in modern farmscapes has reawakened. This theory saturates the globe due to predatory news aggregators within one week. Additionally, three Chaos Insurgency infiltrators were captured attempting to gain access to Site-91, with one step of their directions detailing an up-to-date plan of security patrols. One of the patrol's routes was significantly delayed when all five officers discover pebbles in their footwear and stop to remove them leading to a confrontation with no Foundation casualties. The Foundation then increased patrols at all large containment facilities, resulting in 11 further captures and 6 terminations. SCP-4040, the titular pit of Sloth's Pit Wisconsin, has now been transformed from a bottomless pit to a pit of variable depth. Doctors Sinclair and Reynolds are to remain stationed with radio equipment and supplies for long-term occupancy, in order to continue monitoring it. Despite the misgivings of his captain, Dr. Weddle was declared officially fit for combat on July 30th, and the MTF was subsequently deployed to a Chaos Insurgency facility. As the team flies in on helicopter, Weddle, given the codename of Luck, yells out that he doesn't want to be here, but the team drops in regardless. Weddle twists his ankle upon landing, swearing loudly as the rest of the team prepare to breach the facility. As they duck behind cover from the explosive charges, Weddle leans on another agent for support, knocking his helmet against the agent and dazing himself. He gets pulled down as the explosives detonate, 
stumbling and falling, losing one of his boots in the process. Captain Adams orders one of the team to get Weddell's boot back on, despite his claim that he can do it himself. As the team looks over the opening in the roof they've created, part of the roof collapses in underneath Weddell, causing him to fall in. The team follows him in, finding Weddell sprawled on top of a presumed chaos insurgent, who is now unconscious. One of the team remarks that Weddell's codename means something after all, but Weddell just responds that he doesn't want to do this. As one of the agents checks a wall panel for remotely triggered traps, Weddell manages to twist his other ankle. Clearing most of the traps, the team begins swiftly moving down the hallway as Weddell runs to catch up, falling flat on his face twice. The third time he turns in mid-air, landing on his back, and he is unable to right himself. The team stop to pick him up, which gives them time to notice a trap that they had missed. Weddell then sneezes and says that he can't see, but the team continues on. As they make it to a door, they gather around it, with Weddell ripping his pants as he crouches down, swearing again. A series of gunshots then ring out from the other side, striking the doorframe, but no shots hit the team on the sides. One of the agents throws a flashbang grenade through the door, and Weddell begins to sneeze just as the grenade detonates, blinding him. He begins to scream and yell that he can't see as the rest of the team rushes in, swiftly subduing five insurgents with minimal expenditure of ammunition. Weddell staggers along the wall behind them, occasionally walking directly into the wall with muffled curses. The team mentions that they need to find some stairs, just as Weddell walks through a door and directly into the waist-high railing of a wide, well-lit stairwell, pitching himself over the railing. The rest of the team rushes to help, finding him dangling off the railing by his belt, with his pants half down. They cut him down, and then some more gunfire rings out as the team finds themselves trapped between two fire teams. Half of the team, Weddell included, head down another hallway to find an electrical panel in order to open up the front door for reinforcements. They manage to unlock the front door, but their communications are being jammed by the insurgency. While discussing this, Weddell reaches into his helmet to scratch his nose, finding himself unable to remove his hand afterwards. As he asks for help, they manage to get a signal, calling for backup. One of the team then suddenly sneezes, removing his hand from the circuit breaker at the moment it begins to spark and catch flame. Weddell, on the other hand, has managed to lodge his index finger into his nostril while trying to remove his hand. While rushing back to the rest of the team, Weddell trips on a loose floor tile and stumbles through a plate glass office window. As the others run over to check on him, they find that the floor has caved in again, and Weddell has fallen through. They head back to the stairwell and go down another level, to a large storage facility. Weddell is visible in the center of the facility, dazed, and is headed towards a door on the far wall. One insurgent is standing nearby, with a rifle trained on Weddell. One of the team steps into the room, taking cover behind wooden crates and steel shipping containers. As the insurgent raises his weapon to shoot Weddell, the agent springs out of the shadows and slits his throat at the precise instant the door opens and a second insurgent appears, rifle at the ready. Just as the insurgent begins to remark on their bad luck, the roof collapses above him, crushing his helmet and covering Weddell in debris. They call out to Weddell to ask him if he's alright, but as he's beginning to state how much he hates this, he manages to swallow his helmet microphone and begins to choke. In the aftermath, the base was taken with minimal foundation casualties, with the only real injury being Dr. Weddell's broken collarbone. The Chaos Insurgency, on the other hand, had 37 individuals either incapacitated or killed with seven stolen SCPs, multiple vehicles with paratechnical components, and three prisoners recovered. The analytics department reviewed the shoulder cam footage from the mission, 
noting the near absence of anomalous probability factors, suggesting that Weddell did in fact absorb all SCP-7000 effects over the course of the operation. Meanwhile, SCP-7000 did continue to affect the rest of the globe, including causing seven Chaos Insurgency agents to be captured while installing explosive devices at a Foundation site. All seven attempted to destroy their step compilations before capture, but one was unable to do so as her portable lighter wouldn't light. The recovered step compilation led to the discovery of an insurgency safe house in Poland, leading to the further capture or neutralization of 23 more individuals. SCP-3856-1, the multiversal iteration of researcher Samuel Lloyd residing in baseline reality, choked on a ham sandwich and died. To explain, SCP-3856 consists of each version of Samuel Lloyd across different universes, who, if they are killed in some way, will cause the death of everyone else in the universe due to an apocalyptic scenario. Normally he's an extremely well protected individual, and if there's even a slight chance that he might imminently die, the Foundation sends him off to another universe. After his death due to eating a ham sandwich, the Foundation went on high alert for the imminent escalation of the current SCP-7000 scenario, but curiously, nothing really changed. Finally, three senior Mechanite priests, one for each primary faith, were killed in freak wall bed or Murphy bed accidents. The O5s extended their sympathies and paid for some of the funeral costs. After a brief recuperative period, Dr. Weddle was cleared for active duty again. A series of missions over the following weeks served to mitigate the worst of SCP-7000's veil-threatening elements, though the search for a permanent solution remained ongoing. One of the missions was to repel an attack by the Serpent's Hand on some deep well systems at a Foundation outpost. The MTF repelled the attackers while technicians attempted to reverse the thaumaturgical damage and corrupted code, with Dr. Weddell supervising. The operation was declared successful, with the only injuries coming from Dr. Weddell, including two stubbed toes, a chipped tooth, a broken collarbone, seven broken fingernails, and two herniated discs. On-site paramedical services returned him immediately to active duty. Due to Weddell's resistance to being part of the team, researcher LeBlanc was added to the task force to conduct his debriefings. Weddell claims that he didn't do anything on that mission, but LeBlanc says that they estimate the damaged code involved some 7 million independent variables, each one a small threat to the success of the repair process, but Weddell stopped them from going off. Weddell again insists that he didn't do anything, and then says that they got him a handler. LeBlanc responds that he'd prefer to think of himself as an agent, but Weddell says that if he was his agent, he'd fire him. LeBlanc counters that if he was his client, he'd get him fired, to which Weddell smiles and says that he knows he would. Another mission that they handled was an expert defusal of an improvised thaumonuclear bomb in the Freeport of Three Portlands by the FBI's UIU. This was a joint action with the Foundation via the presence of Dr. Weddell, who was exhausted from an earlier operation that day and was sleeping nearby. Post-defusal investigation revealed three separate anti-tampering measures on hair triggers which had not been tripped and Weddell swallowed three flies during the operation. UIU representatives and Dr. Dan agreed that the technician would not be informed of this correlation. LeBlanc, however, informed Weddell about the operation to his shock. Another mission involves escorting the O5 Council to a classified location in Asia, which involved the MTF teaming up with Alpha-1, the Red Right Hand. The mission was a success, and although Weddell was kept as far away from council members as feasible due to being an active anomaly, O51 still encountered him in compromising positions on three separate occasions. 
Afterwards, he tells LeBlanc that he doesn't want to do this, remarking that the universe has a lot to say about whether his pants are up or down. He says that he can't do this anymore, and he shouldn't let them make him, before crying. LeBlanc says that he won't, and they'll miss the next appointment, asking what would they do, shoot a researcher and the goose that lays the golden egg? Weddell stops crying and yells at LeBlanc that his one job is to kick his sorry ass in gear. The team's 27th mission involved recapturing SCP-682, who had breached containment and approached a town in Western Australia during a folk music festival. Weddell was stationed between the operation zone and the festival, but as containment efforts failed and 682 approached, he was forced to move into the crowd. 682 was finally disabled within 100 meters of the event, an action that nevertheless escaped civilian notice as their attention was focused on Dr. Weddell's altercation with a rogue kangaroo. 682 was returned to containment without incident, while video footage of Weddell being kicked into an industrial barbecue immediately saturated the internet, under such colorful titles as Fat Idiot Gets Wrecked by Kangaroo. Afterwards, Weddell tells LeBlanc that this isn't working, to which LeBlanc agrees, but says that it's helping. Weddell says that he's making an all-time ass out of himself to prolong his own worst nightmare, but LeBlanc calls him a hero, named after William Wallace, one of the most famous heroes of all time. Where would Braveheart have gotten without sticking his neck out for others? To which Weddell says he got his neck stretched. LeBlanc counters by saying that he got a movie at least, but Weddell says that getting a Mel Gibson movie isn't exactly lucky. LeBlanc says that he's sure the council has a backup plan, and this will only go on for a little while longer, but Weddell isn't convinced. This plan is working just fine for the council, and they're going to keep rolling him up that hill and let him fall back down for the rest of his life, like Sisyphus. LeBlanc tries to change the subject, but Weddell becomes increasingly bitter, saying that he's read LeBlanc's mission reports, and says that there's a lot of dry comedy in there, betting that they get a real chuckle around all the water coolers. LeBlanc tries to argue, but Weddell finishes by saying that he regrets becoming friends with him, and tells him to head back to Site 43 to tell them his next set of funny stories in person. Dr. Weddell tried to advance a theory that the SCP-7000 phenomenon was seasonal and would soon dissipate, but the analytics department suggested that this was unlikely. He further theorized that SCP Foundation containment efforts might be responsible as per the discredited allegations leveled by various groups of interest during the SCP-6500 crisis. This too was rejected, as whatever the cause, the actions of the MTF did not appear to neutralize or recognizably worsen the anomaly, merely offsetting its most problematic consequences for the time being. Meanwhile, two more Chaos Insurgency infiltrators were nearly caught after attempting to enter Site-79, due to the chief of security changing the daily password on a hunch. Five days later, Foundation personnel intercepted an urgent call for medical aid from a townhouse on the outskirts of a town in Japan, discovering a cell of 12 insurgents violently ill with COVID. The agent who had encountered the infiltrators at the site had tested positive shortly after their escape. A series of step compilations found in the townhouse outlined a grandiose series of sabotages and thefts to be carried out at Japanese facilities, but on inspection, each one was found to be impractical due to unforeseeable on-the-ground exigencies. On August 24th, an encoded transmission originating from the Chaos Insurgency's hardened mobile array was received by Overwatch Command at Site-01. Though deemed a low priority at the time due to the insurgency's vastly reduced profile in light of their recent heavy losses, the ensuing conversation did finally present one possible causal explanation for the scenario itself. The engineer himself spoke through the feed to the O5 Council, telling them that 
time was almost up and asking if they have a response. The O5s have no idea what he's talking about, however, despite him saying that they have less than an hour to make their decision on his ultimatum. The O5 Council mute the feed and discuss it, saying that they haven't received a message from the insurgency in months. When they unmute it, they find that the engineer had been speaking the whole time, going on about how misguided the Foundation's mission is. O51 says that they never got any messages from the insurgency, with O58 remarking that their vengeance has been particularly intermittent of late, riffing on the insurgency's motto. The engineer says that they sent the message on the Day of Chaos, July 13th. What had apparently happened was the insurgency sent those messages from randomly chosen IP addresses except those IP addresses all happened to correspond to known hackers from the Russian Federation, so they were scanned for viral content and then deleted unread. The engineer says that they'll send it again, and not to delete it this time before ending the call. They detect another message being sent, this time coming from a robocall center in Mumbai, with their antivirus systems again returning another false positive. They open the message regardless, and a video begins playing. The video features the engineer beginning to speak in exaggerated prose about the corruption of the Foundation, to which the O5 Council simply skips through. Eventually, an image of a large machine appears on screen, which the engineer refers to as the Kismet device, claiming that it now exercises total control over the course of fate. He says that all mechanisms of chance and contingency will be irrevocably broken, and the suffocating veil of the enemy will fall away. The alternative for the O5 Council is for them to surrender their positions and merge the Foundation with the Insurgency. The Council discusses the Chaos Insurgency, as they haven't been doing too well since the start of the SCP-7000 situation. They've lost over 200 personnel, had a catastrophic loss of equipment and facilities, and haven't won a single fight against the Foundation so far. They've escalated to open warfare in desperation, but it's not looking good for them. O51 remarks that it's good that they didn't get that message back towards the start of the situation. If the Chaos Insurgency are in control of this situation, they've got a funny way of showing it. The Council decides in the end to not call the Engineer back. The Engineer's explanation for the cause of SCP-7000 was filed for further study, and despite the apparent passing of the ultimatum's deadline, the overall situation with SCP-7000 did not appear to change. A seven-year-old French girl became the world champion in chess after starting playing on July 7th and has never lost a game since. Further investigation revealed that the girl is the grandchild of a high-ranking member of the Foundation, who was encouraged by her grandfather to start playing due to their knowledge of the SCP-7000 event. The individual was also responsible for moving the event up from its next planned occurrence in 2023, and his granddaughter's unorthodox inclusion on the roster. Due to his seniority, however, this matter has not been pursued further. Additionally, Site-41 became occupied by the Chaos Insurgency, but the periodic and unpredictable amnestic effect plaguing all facilities and personnel relating to the Anti-Memetics Division strikes the insurgents full force during their occupation. Disoriented, they exit the site and are immediately detained by guards stationed at the perimeter. Foundation researchers afterwards repeatedly tried to further weaponize this anomaly, but are immediately afflicted by the same condition in each case. Finally, predictive meteorology has become ineffective, but this change has escaped public notice at this time. Having been relieved from his post by Dr. Weddle, LeBlanc began a personal investigation into SCP-7000. After consulting with Dr. Blank, he visited Weddell's elderly parents in their home at the Foundation-operated retirement village 
of Sunset Cove in Pensacola, Florida. LeBlanc asks them if they ever got the impression that William was carrying some sort of burden. Mindy, his mother, says of course, as William is always thinking about others. This causes LeBlanc to laugh while the Weddells watch in silence. He then apologizes and says that he was remembering something. His father, Simon, says that William never spared a thought for himself and spent all of his time fussing over what could go wrong with other people and what he could do about it. Mindy says that William couldn't live with himself if something happened and he'd passed up the chance to help. She says that it started when he was 12 and she got lung cancer, with the doctors not expecting her to make it. Simon says that he would stay up at night praying, although Mindy doesn't think it was out of religion, but she can't quite remember. LeBlanc mentions that he has some medicine with him to help them remember, and Simon asks if he means Nestics. Apparently they had taken them before, when the Foundation were checking up on William after some accident at work, asking if it could have been his fault and if he was reliable. They think about those Nestics quite a lot, thinking about how much good they could do in a place like this, as they have a friend who can't even remember her own children. Mindy tried to tell her about Nestics once, but she couldn't get the words out, and they suspect it has something to do with where William works. LeBlanc says that he's sorry, and he can't tell them any more about it, but William wouldn't want to put them in any danger. LeBlanc suspects that this is all about that need to protect people, as he's trying to protect everyone, and LeBlanc doesn't think he even really knows what from. Mindy says that she'll tell him what William prayed about, if he promises to tell William to think of himself from time to time. LeBlanc says that he thinks he can manage that. Following his return to Site 43, LeBlanc attempted to make contact with Weddell, but his entreaties were ignored, with Weddell spending most of his time on missions with the MTF. On August 26th, after his 68th mission, Weddell abandoned his post, but was recovered almost immediately by another MTF, having failed to either disable the tracking devices installed on his personal phone or turn the device off entirely. During his brief period AWOL, he recorded a short video on his phone. The video seems to be taken outside, in the dark, with inadequate color correction filters enabled. Weddell says that he's putting his foot down, and proceeds to stamp his foot, before looking down and back up in obvious irritation and disgust. He says that they'll probably lobotomize him once they get this message, and then proceeds to look up lobotomies on the internet, eventually finding out that they cause apathy, which he remarks sounds nice. He says that maybe he'll be a funnier clown when he doesn't care what's happening to him, but he can't keep carrying on like this so the universe can laugh. He then drops his phone, taking two attempts to pick it back up. He continues, saying that he didn't like the way his life was going before this either, and this is just a lot more of the same. When he joined the Foundation back in 2000, the director told him something like, Our world is filled with hidden terrors, and stranger stuff than you could possibly imagine. He wanted Weddell to know what he was getting into, but Weddell said that it didn't matter, as the stuff he'd seen was already strange in a real bad way, and he was looking forward to seeing the scary stuff. What he found out though was that the scary stuff isn't always different from stupid stuff. He just didn't expect that all the weirdness he'd be seeing would be so dumb. Everybody thinks what happens to him is funny, but it's not and he guesses that he thought it would end when he joined the Foundation, but it didn't. He proceeds to drop his phone again, along with his glasses for the second time, before continuing on his rant. This thing has gone on way past scientific proof, and he figured that fate just wanted him to give up, so he gave up, and it only got worse. So now he just wonders what he's supposed to do and remarks that he's not even the primary anomaly here, and isn't even the main character in his own story. This isn't how he wanted to be remembered, 
and unlike everyone else, he doesn't get to decide that. He says that it's selfish of him, but he's done with this, and they're going to have to find some other way to fix this problem that doesn't involve him. He then says that he's going to do the only thing he can do, and end it all. After unsuccessfully trying to stop filming and putting the phone in his pocket, he pulls it out again and says that that came out wrong. He meant that he's going to run away. As he ends the video, however, he's approached by the MTF. Afterwards, Dr. Dan brought him over to a Foundation Mission Control Center, where he brings up a view of SCP-179, who is pointing arms in all directions. Dr. Dan explains that this is Saul Susser, who stands vigil over the stars and directs their attention to potential threats. Weddell comments that it looks more like she's directing their attention to Chaos Undivided, referencing a Warhammer 40k faction. Dan says that she normally has a lot fewer arms, and they're usually pointing in specific directions. Most of his colleagues are convinced that the SCP-7000 situation has driven her batty, and she's just acting out of confusion. Dan, however, thinks that she's still trying to communicate something to us. He thinks that she's pantomiming the Wheel of Fortune, the tarot card, which represents change, the alteration of one's situation, success, fate, luck. It's a reminder that there are intractable, implacable, impersonal forces constricting and constructing our destinies. Weddell remarks that it always seemed plenty personal to him, to which Dan says that him taking offense is good, as it's the first step towards treating this as a conversation with the universe. He suggests making it a positive conversation, but Weddell responds that if fortune is a wheel, he's strapped to it, and it's spinning, and everybody is chucking knives at him. Dan asks him if he's been punished with his own sudden usefulness, and Weddell thinks that he is, because he liked being useless, since useless people get left alone. Dan responds that he was in detention for 10 years, so he knows what it's like to be left alone. Weddell says that he'd give anything to be a pariah, since he's a laughingstock, and Dan can't know what that's like. Dan says that he wouldn't say that if he knew what was behind the black boxes, referencing the fact that Dr. Dan's last name is always hidden in documents behind a black box. Apparently he was at Site 19 in the late 2000s, and all of the researchers there had a gimmick. Kondraki had his camera and his hat, Gerald drove the way that Weddell does everything else, Clef had a shotgun, and Dan blackboxed his last name. Weddell bets that it's something really dumb, and asks what it would take for him to weasel it out of him. Dan tells him to outsmart him, and they move back to the topic of Weddell's chronic inability to accept the attention of others. Weddell responds that he's had enough attention for a lifetime, and just once he'd like to step on a rake without anybody around to point and giggle. He laughs and says that he still can't believe that two months ago he actually said out loud that it can't get any worse. Dan says that he doesn't mind telling him, but this is the new status quo. They don't see any way out of it, and he'll be working with the MTF for the foreseeable future, at least until they give up and drop the veil. Weddell muses that they could give it to him and he'll drop it in seconds, but Dan reminds him that he's having a conversation with the universe, so he should think bigger, pointing at SCP-179 again. The messenger of the cosmos is trying to send a message to specifically Weddell, and that message is to seize the moment. Weddell doesn't think that she's trying to communicate with him, but he's the only one that this entire event has singled out. They begin having flare activity near their drone, so they tell Weddell to back away from the terminals to avoid losing another one. Dan has Weddell wave goodbye to SCP-179, despite his arguments that she can't see him, and she appears to return the wave with all eight of her arms. 
Weddell thinks that they trained her to do that, but Dan says that this is his debut on the world stage, as he's making a positive change for himself and for the world. For all they know, this is what he was always meant to do. He's the most important person in creation now, and ultimately Dan tries to convince Weddell that he should try enjoying this experience and embrace this insane nonsense. He asks Weddell if he's ever not been miserable, to which he says no, and then asks if he's ever tried. Afterwards, Dr. Weddell agreed to return to duty with the MTF, and Captain Adams reported that he appeared calm and resigned to his station. Dr. Dan indicated to the O5 Council that his plan for neutralizing SCP-7000 was now in motion, but nevertheless, the event continued as it had been for the following two days. Three rogue sharks were discovered in Martha's Vineyard, which were subsequently captured and released by SCPS vehicles disguised as American Coast Guard, with the implementation of a cover story involving filming of the fictitious Jaws 5 return to Amity Island. Over in New Zealand, a tactical nuclear detonation was detected over the unoccupied Auckland Islands. Foundation personnel responded to the scene, discovering the remains of the Chaos Insurgency's hardened mobile array burning in the harbor. Documents recovered from the site attest to an apparently lost step compilation culminating with a nuclear strike on Site 01. Though the state of the wreckage and unfamiliarity with the platform make precise determinations impossible, Foundation engineers report the likeliest explanation for the apparent accident is a catastrophic launch bay door failure. Further forensic investigation reveals the presence of anomalous components suffused with chronons, antichronons, and tachyons, suggesting the engine itself may have been present on the array at the time of detonation. In light of its recent loss of material and manpower, the Chaos Insurgency's activity class was reduced to Below the Serpent's Hand, each sect of the Church of the Broken God, and Are We Cool Yet, among others, for the first time since their respective group of interest classifications. Frustrated with being stonewalled by Dr. Weddell, LeBlanc confronted him in his quarters on the night of August 28th. He enters his room to find him laying on the couch, in his underwear. Weddell says that he locked the door, but LeBlanc had just hit a bunch of random numbers into the keypad. Weddell swears, and then laughs and says that yeah, that would work. LeBlanc tells him that he's been talking to Weddell's parents, because he's stuck in a holding pattern, and he wouldn't be a very good friend if he left him there. He went to speak with Weddell's parents, because of how Weddell says that this has been his life for as long as he can remember, so he wanted to confirm that. The two leave Weddell's room to head to a section of the facility with no security cameras. Upon returning to view, Weddell appears distraught and agitated. He heads back to his room alone, pacing for several hours before pushing a variety of random items off of his bed and lying down to sleep. Just after midnight, he begins speaking to himself. He says that it really can't be that simple, and mentions the line about himself from the SCP-7000 file which states that he's inconsequential and requires no containment. After some silence, he then says that LeBlanc must be right. After 49 minutes of silence, he asks what they want him to say, if he's learned his lesson and if he's overflowing with the milk of human kindness here. He swears at the ceiling, and after a period of silence and mumbling, he asks if it hears him, at which point a light fixture detaches from the ceiling and falls, shattering in a hail of sparks as it hits the bed frame. Weddell says that yeah, it hears him, as the bed sheets catch on fire. The following morning, Weddell reported for duty once more, with Captain Adams reporting that he seemed refreshed, but also rueful, but also more than a little bit smug, and she doesn't know why. 
As Dr. Dan had predicted, following his debriefing of Weddell, the SCP-7000 phenomenon gradually decreased in severity. A thorough canvassing from the analytics department showed no unusual probabilistic effects on August 29th, and probabilistic anomalies resumed their prior functionality at staggered intervals over the course of the day. The narrative returned to Sloth's pit, the pit itself regained its former depth, and SCP-179 demanifested five arms before resuming her usual routine of threat identification. The Foundation had suffered 38 casualties over the course of the event, 36 of which had been identified after their deaths as double agents for the Chaos Insurgency, and two of which are under continued investigation. Despite significant global economic reshuffling, structural and material destruction, and immeasurable interpersonal catastrophe, all civilian deaths attributed to SCP-7000 appear to have involved individual moral failing or spectacularly poor decision-making processes. The Foundation is in the process of carrying out several cover-up operations, including smear campaigns against the present generation of mathematicians, fraudulent scientific discourse to account for unusual mutations and atmospheric effects, the creation of the non-existent Sagittarii meteor shower, fabrication of explanations for the total collapse of all futures markets, and the containment of inexplicably resurrected deceased baseball player Lou Gehrig, with his sudden appearance at Yankee Stadium explained away as an impersonation in bad taste. Nevertheless, with the immediate crisis apparently over, the 7000 MTF was placed on indefinite hiatus, and its members returned to their former stations. Etra internally declared SCP-7000 tentatively neutralized, and stood down from priority alert after the autopsy of researcher Samuel Lloyd revealed that it was in fact from a different universe. The correct version of Samuel Lloyd was found alive and well in a Chaos Insurgency safe house after a rash of surrenders and defections during said organization's general disarray in the wake of SCP-7000. Dr. Dan found Dr. Weddell at a Foundation-run pub in Canada on the evening of August 29th. He's sitting at the bar, drinking a bottle of beer, as most of the bar's patrons are watching the television, which is showing a news report covering the sudden dispersal of seven large storm systems around the globe. Dan asks if Weddell is drowning his sorrows, but Weddell says that his sorrows can swim, and he bets that they could drown him. Dan asks him how he's holding up, to which Weddell says that he's upright enough for a guy with a knife in his back. He's not mad, as this is what Dan is known for, the guy who doesn't need to play a game of chess to see how it ends. Dan says that he supposes Weddell figured it out then. Weddell responds that he didn't, of course he didn't, he's never figured out anything in his life before the other day. Someone else figured it out for him, and then he figured that they were right. A friend told him that this whole situation was all about Weddell, and that he caused it. Dan has also figured it out, and asks if it's okay if he gloats. It started with Dr. Blank's wedding, and Weddell's assistants dating. It's a pretty chummy crowd at Site 43, but now they're all pulling away from him, and he lost it. Weddell says that he wanted to make something of himself, and wanted to be someone. He wanted a wife, until he thought he was putting her in danger, and wanted a family, until he thought that his bad luck was contagious. In the end, he just wanted everything to stay the same, and he couldn't even have that. He really thought his life would turn around at some point, but he thought that for 20 years. He decided he was done, and gave up. He was never going to be popular or noticed, so he let the universe win. But the universe wasn't done playing. He tried to be content with nothing, so the anomaly made him the single most important, invaluable, famous person in the Foundation, in precisely the worst possible way, because it wasn't what he wanted. Weddell doesn't even want to know what the body count of SCP-7000 was. 
but Dan says that it was mostly bad people or dumb people, and a whole lot of people got a violent wake-up call that they won't soon forget. They got a second chance to chart their courses in life, because of Weddell, indirectly. It's not his fault, as it's not like he ever had control over what was happening. Like everything else in his life, it just sort of happened to him. And as soon as he decided that he kind of liked it, after their discussion, the coroner turned again. He's not allowed to enjoy anything that much, so it took back everything it gave and turned Weddell back into nothing. Weddell says that that's a pretty sensible explanation, him being tricked into ending a K-class scenario, but that isn't what happened. A long time ago, he made a pact with the universe to live a sucky life, but not too sucky. And then he forgot about it, and broke the pact, so this was the revenge. We're then given the excerpt from the interview between LeBlanc and Weddell's parents, after he gave them some nestics. Mindy says that she remembers it like it's happening right now in front of her. They were in their old house, and she was going to bed after smoking in the garage. She thought that William would be asleep, but as she walked past his room, she heard him whispering to himself. He was saying, Take anything else you want. Take all my stuff. Take all my friends. Take all my chances. Take everything good and keep it. Just don't take my mom. Don't hurt my parents. Hurt me instead, for as long as you want. I can take it. I promise. Please. Simon says that a boy shouldn't have had to go through that, and Mindy remarks that she never smoked again. Back in the present, Weddell says that it turns out he was talking to the universe a long time before he met Dan. He told the universe to use him as a punching bag, and then went to sleep, completely forgetting about the prayer. Dan asks if he's a two-time reality bender, or if he prayed to the ceiling and Fortuna heard him, referencing the Roman goddess of fortune. Weddell says that something heard him, and it took him up on the offer. He got good value for the next few decades, but then something happened. Everybody else was moving on and up except for him, and he wanted that. On some other unmemorable night, half drunk, lying on his couch in his dorm, he asked for it out loud. He didn't even remember this until his friend thought to check the security feed. Dan says that he thinks that he caused his own luck anomaly, and then made it worse by breaking the terms. And then what? As deciding he liked it wouldn't fix that problem. Weddell admits that no, it wouldn't, because he decided that he didn't like being important at everyone else's expense, so he did something about it. He thought that this was all happening to him, but in fact, he's in control of his life and sets the terms. He just never knew it until now. Dan asks him if he intentionally set things back to normal by making a deal with the devil again and speaking to his ceiling. Weddell admits that that's pretty much true, but says that Dan's speech did help though. Dan asks if he's grasped the full implications of this yet, saying that he destroyed the Chaos Insurgency. Weddell laughs and says that every clown has his day. He then realizes that there's another implication, that he outsmarted Dr. Dan. After some prodding, he gets Dan to admit that his last name is Daniels, making his name Dr. Daniel Daniels. After some silence, Weddell extends his hand and introduces himself as Dr. William Weddell, the two shaking hands. Dan says that he told them that he was more than just a gimmick, so he wasn't wrong about everything. Weddell asks if they're going to reclassify SCP-7000 to neutralized, but Dan has a better idea. Dr. Blank and LeBlanc then arrive, with LeBlanc asking who's buying and Weddell responding that he'll flip him for it. 
The following day, Dan presented another briefing on SCP-7000 to the O5 Council, saying that if they do that and reclassify the LK scenario as 7000-D, then the invisible powers that be should be happy. This will take all of the credit away from Weddell, which should satisfy the flagellistic urges of his anomaly, and it's not like the Chaos Insurgency are in any position to argue. If he's right, they should never have to go through this ridiculous rigmarole again. 0510 asks Dan for his rationale behind the new 7000 file, wondering if it doesn't risk tipping the balance back in Weddell's favor, causing another crisis. Dan says that the loss of prestige ought to counterbalance it, and he's run it past the analytics department, who concur. 0513 asks why do it at all then, as Weddell was never that important, and never will be again. Dan responds that he thinks they owe it to him, for being such a good sport. The council agrees to the proposal, with 051 asking if Weddell will go along with this, Dan says that he'll be happy enough, as he had a hand in it, apparently supplying the photo for the file. We're finally given the two different versions of SCP-7000, the first of which is the decommissioned version. SCP-7000-D was a progressive probability failure on the planet Earth during July and August of 2022, precipitated by an ontokinetic eigenweapon known as the Kismet device. The device was destroyed by the SCP Foundation via tactical nuclear deployment. As the effects of the probability failure have subsequently receded, it is presumed that the device's ongoing intervention in baseline reality was required to sustain it. The current SCP-7000 on the other hand is a probability sink, concentrating local misfortune on its own person. Dr. William Wallace Weddell, Deputy Chair of Replication Studies at Site-43. There is no relationship between SCP-7000 and SCP-7000-D. So, as we learned, when Weddell was 12, his mother got terminal lung cancer, so he made a late night prayer to any force in the universe that would hear it. He asked for them to save his mother, and in return, they could take everything else good from him and could hurt him for as long as they want. Whatever force out there that hurt it accepted the agreement, saving his mother, but cursing him with perpetual bad luck. He went through life for many years with his bad luck, never suffering anything catastrophic, but pretty much always keeping him in a pretty sucky position. This changed one night when he was half drunk and lying on his couch, sick of his life and his bad luck, when he spoke out to the universe once again, this time asking for a change. This broke the terms of his past agreement, where he said that he could take all the bad stuff for the rest of his life, so this was the anomaly's revenge. It began completely screwing up probabilities and superstitions everywhere across the globe, except for Weddell. This suddenly made him the most important person in the Foundation, and subsequently the most important person on the planet. The world continued to decline due to the effect, as Weddell continued to resent his newfound importance, until he realized where his anomaly came from, and what he could do about it. He decided to speak to the universe once again, telling that, that he's learned his lesson, and to put things back to the way they were. In the end, the entire scenario was blamed on the Chaos Insurgency and their probabilistic engine, giving Weddell none of the prestige or credit, and he was given a token position in the database. While the article is certainly filled with humor, there's also an undeniable touching element here as well. Dr. Weddell is not an enviable man, as he's left to perpetually suffer from bad luck until he dies and most people think that he's clumsy and insufferable. In reality, he keeps his distance from people because he cares enough to not want to hurt them or bring them misfortune due to his anomaly. Weddell is ultimately a good person, given a bad lot in life, and he knows now that he has to keep that bad lot 
or he risks the entire world suffering from a luck anomaly. The big thousand entries on the SCP wiki tend to be large, bombastic, or otherwise epic articles, but SCP-7000 is pretty simple. It's just one unlucky man. <laughs>